Great. Again, uh, there are no students and it's face to face class. And yeah, you, you guys still haven't joined the meeting room. Now I'm just going to start with the lecture so we can proceed. <clears throat> Right, the for week eight, you'll be having an exercise on liquefaction analysis. <clears throat> Just a recap, liquefaction is basically when your soil is like squeezed during earthquake. Okay. And the water in the soil has no other way out. So what the water does is it tries to escape the soil layer, but the but what actually happens is that the soil is just being squeezed, it loses volume, all the air spaces are being closed off, and they are they are rapidly filled instead by water. And yeah, the, the soil will be just continuously be squeezed during earthquake. Uh, the shaking it will just try to compress the soil and eventually the water will fill up the soil voids and eventually it will come to a point where the water will start supporting the loads or the weight okay, instead of the soil grains. Okay. When that happens, it means that the soil grains lose their green to green contact. So basically, all the soil grains are not are just floating in water, and basically your your soil layer or your ground um, will behave like a fluid. Okay? It loses uh, effective stress okay? because there is no soil skeleton to support the load anymore. You get, you're just getting every, everything is just pore pressure. So at that point, at, at the point of liquefaction, the total stresses are just equal to the pore pressures. So when you, when you don't have an effective stress, you don't have shear strength, and you basically have a fluid or a, or a liquid. Now we I have this exercise here. Right, exercise two, it's worth 50 points. And I think this is probably your only exercise for module two. You can get the files from the provided Google Drive link. And then uh, ideally you, you have watched the, Ideally, you have watched the liquefaction concept lecture, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, this one. So you're supposed to watch this first before doing the exercise. But yeah, it's fine. I mean, you can still follow the exercise anyway. It's really just a matter of uh, putting in the data, right? So yeah, just go to the tutorial folder of the exercise and you will see two files. You have your spreadsheet. So basically this is the liquefaction analysis um, as done using a spreadsheet. And the other one is the borehole log, which was the data or the basis of the analysis. Okay, I hope you're quite familiar, already familiar with borehole drilling logs. They are just the record of the characteristics of the materials encountered on the subsurface during drilling. There are many types of borehole logs. This one is what we call a geotechnical borehole log because it records all the soil and rock strength parameters and other conditions that affect their um, physical properties relating to geotechnical engineering. All right. Uh, 
Yeah, the main exercise is to conduct the refraction analysis on all boreholes in BH1. So this, um, this is your data. So you need to work on this. This is the exercise, right? You just have to do analysis on this um, borehole log from which, which is uh, taken from Cantaba, Pampanga. Uh, it was done as part of a uh, road project. Okay. And then, um, yeah, uh, there's also a hint here. In liquefaction analysis, you have to actually know the deterministic peak ground acceleration or the PJ that you can get from from the Fukushima in Tanaga. Okay. Uh, there's also a bonus point here. You can calculate the total vertical settlement uh, during liquefaction. Okay. And then determine if the amount of vertical settlement is acceptable. Okay. And then the expected output is basically you just have to have a document summarizing the uh, earthquake uh, the earthquake that you used as your seismic source. So basically the earthquake or the fault, the distance from, from the site and its magnitude. And then list down the soil layers that are potentially liquefiable or can trigger liquefaction. Oh, sorry, uh, potentially liquefiable, meaning they have the potential to liquefy, but you, you haven't really tested them. And then C is the list of soil layers which can trigger liquefaction. These are basically the soils that have a factor of safety of less than one versus liquefaction. And then uh, also include a, an appendix showing the screenshots of your spreadsheet. And then, yeah, if you have, if you're doing the bonus points, you also have to include the discussions and relevant images. Now, so that is the brief of the exercise. I'm just gonna show you the tutor the tutorial. All right. This is a geotechnical borehole log. Right, so you can see uh, it has a project name. It has a, so I'm just gonna run through the basics of a geotechnical borehole log so that you're quite also familiar with it. I'm not sure if this is being discussed in other courses, so bear, please, please bear with the um, introduction. You have a title, you have your project, um, project name, the location, basically the address of the project, the elevation of the rig, but in here there's no data, but that's fine. The final or the termination depth of the borehole, meaning what depth did the drilling or the borehole drilling stop. So this one is 21.96 meters. The date of the drilling, so that should include the start and the end date. And then the water table or basically the depth of the ground water. And then date gauge, I think that's the date when they measured the water table. Normally you should measure the water table um, three days after the finish of, after the completion of the drilling. Also have your borehole coordinates. This is also very important. Uh, the name of the driller, okay. Other stuff that should be seen on a borehole log will include the equipment, the type of drilling equipment used. Okay. Right now, um, you have uh, plenty of columns here. The first column is the depth. So this is zero meters, this is one meter, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 meters. Second column is the sample number. So basically, 
for every layer or every interval, we take soil samples, we put them in, we put them in plastic bags, and then we send them to a laboratory for testing. And of course, those plastic bags will have names so that you can basically, once you get the results from the laboratory, you can plot them in the borehole log. Okay? Next is the percent recovery or how much, how much soil did you recover or how much rock did you recover, okay? which you can easily see from the sampling tube. If the sampling tube is like 100% filled, then you get 100% recovery. If it's just half, then that's 50% recovery. And then um, sample type, this is just a symbology. The black corresponds to your, what we call the SPT sampling. Excess mean you didn't take, you did not take any samples. Log symbol, basically just the soil type. Okay, so you have different symbols per soil type. You have stripes for ML, dots for sand. So this one is sand, this silty sand. So it's a combination of dots and um, vertical stripes. Unified soil classification. So I hope you're familiar with this already. So SC corresponds to clay sand. CH corresponds to fat clays. ML means um, lean silt or low plasticity silt, SM means silty sand, SP means poorly sorted sand, CH means fat clay or high plasticity clay. Yeah, and so on. You can just uh, search them in the net. Description. Okay, so you have your description of your um, soil and there is a standard court convention for this, right? So I hope you're be sure to be familiar with this one before you graduate, especially if you're like doing or taking a job that's in the consultancies. Um, borehole logging is, is the most essential uh, skill in engineering geology or geotechnical engineering. It, it's just as important as doing, as taking a, a strike and dip. Okay. So yeah, there's this uh, convention in describing a soil. The main soil type is capitalized. So this one is sand. And then the secondary constituents are in, in lowercase, okay. Uh, clay, gravelly, or adjectives with, with ending with Y, I think that's around, you have a certain percentage here to say that it's clear, clear or gravelly. Uh, just refer to the USCS uh, description. Okay. And then the description, you will start with the color, so grayish brown, and then you, you proceed with the with the description of, of the green sizes. So find the coarse green sand. And then you have also your secondary constituents like fine gravel. And then usually the last description is the description of the plasticity of the soil. So considerable to moderately plastic pines. And then you also have your uh, strength of the soil or density. So this is medium dense. Okay, so that's the description. And then for the other testing, you have your standard penetration test. You have three blows. Okay. Blow one, two, three. You only need the last two. Okay, so you just take the sum of them. 14 plus three, you get 17. And usually this is plotted in a graph for basically just for visualization purposes. Um, moisture content, basically that's the weight of water divided by the weight of the soil. 
So if you have a 100% moisture content, that simply means that your water and soil are have equal weights. So they're just one, they're one is to one in terms of their weight. Atterberg limits, um, these are the basically the boundaries which of moisture content in which the soil will, will uh, behave. So if you have a liquid limit of 29, that means if your moisture content is greater than 29, it means that your soil will start behaving like a liquid. So as you can see here, in the moisture content is already 32 and the liquid limit is 29. So that means at the time of testing, the soil is already probably behaving like a liquid. But that's not connected to liquid factor. Okay? That's, um, liquid in the sense that it's just really saturated. Liquefaction is a totally different animal. You're talking about a soil that is being agitated by earthquake. So that's, that's uh, yeah. So Atterberg limits is all about the static conditions of the soil. Liquefaction is about the dynamic or earthquake, drilling earthquake conditions. Finally, you have your sieve analysis. Which, are, which is basically in geology or particle size analysis. Okay, you can see the person they just that pass through the sieve depending on their size. So a lot of a lot most of the soil pass through the number four sieve and then 10, 4, 10, 200. 200 is important because this is the sieve for the fines content. Fines, uh, by fines I mean the silts and the clays. All right. So that is the introduction to the borehole log. Okay, it's not yet, you don't really, I haven't talked really about the exercise yet. Okay. Now, uh, how do we do a liquefaction analysis on this kind of data? Um, if you've seen the lecture on liquefaction analysis concepts, uh, you're already probably familiar with this, but basically liquefaction analysis is, I would simplify it as basically the, the strength of the soil versus the um, forces of the earthquake. Okay, So it's like soil versus earthquake. That's it. Uh, now, uh, Doing that calculation is, is another thing. It, it's already, that's a more, it's really complicated. But basically just remember that the refraction analysis is about soil strength versus earthquake. All right, now, it's gonna show you the The spreadsheet that we can that we use to do a liquefaction analysis. Okay. So, um, very important um, stuff here is that this spreadsheet is color coded. Okay. Basically, all colors in yellow are your input cells, meaning you have to input some data in there. All right, now, um, the first step in liquefaction analysis is to do the screening, okay? Screening is basically you are just um, trying to eliminate or find out find out which soils can actually undergo liquefaction. Okay. So basically you're just looking for suspect soils, basically. So they're just suspect at, at this point. So liquefaction screening, you have different tests. You, you look for the um, D10 and D50 uh, 
parameter. Uh, D50 means the mean, the mean, um, the mean soil size. Okay. That's the size in which 50% of the soil will pass through. And then D10 is like the size of the seed wherein only 10% of the soils are passed through. So that's the smaller size. The point of this is that D10 and D50 are, you're, they're just asking here if the soil is like um, gap graded or meaning the soil has like very big and very small particles. Or, yeah, uh, basically D10 and D50 is just a, part, a particle size criteria. Okay, normally, gap graded soils are the most susceptible to liquefaction because they have like very big spaces in which the water can enter. And when you have soils with very big pore spaces, they can undergo very large uh, volume changes. Uh, you also have your plasticity index criteria. Basically, this hinges on the concept that plastic soils are stick are basically cohesive. They impart some strength, and they resist uh, liquefact uh, volume changes, which can lead to liquefaction. Uh, below water table, this is also very important. Basically. You need water in order to trigger liquef liquefaction. So if your soil is not below the water table, you basically don't really have enough water to trigger liquefaction. Okay. So you have these one, two, three, four, four questions okay, relating to the particle size, the plasticity, and the water table. And just one no answer will already trigger a non non-liquefaction uh, can will already say it's enough no, to classify the soil as non-liquefiable. Okay, so you can see here, yes, uh, this, the soil layer in um, one to two meters depth. It has a yes in D50 in D10, but it has a no in the, in the plastic criteria, plasticity criteria, and ha but has a yes on the water table. But the overall answer is no. Okay, so basically, for a soil to be considered potentially liquefiable or a suspect for liquefaction, all the criteria should answer to yes. Okay. All right, now, um, how did we do this analysis? So basically, you have to look at the, wait a minute. Sorry, uh, basically, um, where was I? Yeah, let's saw the borehole log data first. Okay, so. And look at this uh, sheet. Okay, so let's just focus on these uh, cells for now. All right, first, you have to, of course, put in the borehole name, but this is basically just for um, 
this is basically just for the purposes of being able to track down the uh, data that you're that you're working on. It's not really needed for analysis. The next information is the water table depth. So you can see here in the header of the borehole log, you can see here the water table. So it is 1.4 meters below ground surface. So yeah, you need that. So what I put here is, is water table is 1.4 meters, right? And then the start and the end of the layers. Okay, so layer one, So the first layer is this one, this is the, um, so you can look at the layers, um, each uh, SPT testing, um, the soil layers here are defined by the SPT testing interval. So we just look at this testing, okay? So we have a SPT test at one meter, okay? So that would, in geotechnical engineering convention, that would represent the soil at one meter depth and the soil above that depth. So, so in this case, this SPT testing represents this layer. So the testing at one meter represents the soil layer at zero to one meter. Okay. Okay, so I put in here, Start of layer one is uh, zero to one meter. You can also write the sample number, which is SS1, but uh, it's, it's, uh, this is really just optional, okay? And then the next is the particle size analysis. So in this day, in this borehole, we have, um, sieve analysis data for, for, for sieve, sieve number four, sieve number 10, sieve number 40, sieve number 100, and sieve number 200. So let's just input that in here. So again, we're just working on layer one. So um, sieve not, so this is layer one, and then sieve um, sieve number four has a value of seventy one percent. So you just put it as seventy one. That's all right. That corresponds to seventy one percent. Next is number ten. So number sieve number ten is sixty one. So just put in there sixty one. And then the next is number 40, just put in there 46. And then 100, you put in there 36. And then 200, you put in there 31. Okay. Now you can see here that there are gaps or basically not all the green sizes were not filled up. Okay. So you don't have data for these sizes. And that's completely fine. I mean, um, usually, uh, as long as the essential sizes are covered, it's not a problem. Now, uh, the spreadsheet here will automatically tell you if one of the essential sizes are missing. Okay, so let's try, let's try deleting some values. Okay, for example, number two or the fine C is very important. If you don't have data, it will output you an incomplete data or INC data. That means you don't have a complete data. Okay. So yeah, uh, we're done with the sizes. Okay. And yeah, it, you already have a screening, screening result here. Okay. So this D50, D10 is based on the green sizes you have entered here. Sorry. So actually I have inputted the plasticity index 
the other one is the is the plasticity index or the PI. So I'm just gonna put here eleven, as shown in the borehole log. That's eleven. All right. So after you've entered all that information, so basically we started the what with the water table depth and then the depth of the soil layer. And then the particle size analysis or the sieve analysis, and then the plasticity index. Once you've done that, you will get a, an assessment if the soil is a suspect for liquefaction or not. Now, since the soil layer is above the water table, okay, so the water table is 1.4 meters, but the soil layer is between one, 0 to 1. So it means it's, it's shallower than the water table and hence the soil layer is, is not below the water table. The answer is no, it's not susceptible to liquefaction. Now for the other layers, you basically just repeat the process. Okay? So for soil layer number two, you can see here in the borehole logs, okay? You get 99, 98, 98, 97. So I just inputted that. And then the plasticity index is 35. So it's in there. Um, this time around, okay, uh, it, the soil layer here is, is above the water table. So it's yes, but the, the soil is, too, is uh, highly plastic. The plasticity is too high. So the answer is no. And the overall assessment is, not, is that it's not susceptible to liquefaction, right? So that is the so that's the uh, soil uh, soil liquefaction screening. That's that's just uh, that's just your step one. Step two is your thickening analysis. So we're gonna go back to this uh, spreadsheet and just look at this other side of the spreadsheet. Okay. So in here we have um, we have two columns: the SPTN value and the and the specific gravity. You also have an optional column here, which is the USCS type. Okay. Um, let's go back to soil layer one. Okay. So you can see here soil layer one. The SPTN value is 17. Okay. So we put in here 17. And then the next input column is the soil layer specific gravity, or basically the density of the soil. Now, the problem here in this borehole log is that there is no data on specific gravity. So you only have data on SPT, on moisture content, and on Atterberg limits and sieve analysis, but you don't have data on, it, on the specific gravity or the unit weight. Now, the workaround in there is to basically just use the correlation values for specific gravity and the soil type. And fortunately for the spreadsheet uh, that I made here, the spreadsheet here can automatically tell you what is the specific gravity as long as you know the type of soil that you have. So in this case, the soil type here is SC. Okay, or clay sand. So just type in here SC and you will get a value here. Sorry, or you can you can basically just check this uh, website. All 
or let's just try using another spreadsheet that has an automatic um, automatic way to determine the unit weight. So let's try using this one instead. Okay. So let me clean up this uh, spreadsheet first so that you can work on your exercise easily later on. I'm going to hide all this all the other spreadsheets because you don't need them for now. Okay, so basically for the exercise, you're just doing one borehole. Okay. Let's clean this up first. All right, so again, we're going to start over with the tutorial. So, all right, so just look, let's just look at these spreadsheets uh, side by side. DCES. DCES and then water table is 1.4. And then let's start again with soil layer one. It starts soil layer one so is zero, and then the end depth is one meters. One meter, sorry. <laughs> Sample number is SS1. And then let's just input the sieve analysis data. So Let's start with number four sieve. So that's 71%. Uh, then number 10 sieve is 61. Number 40 is 46. Number 100 is 36. Number 200 is 31. EI is 11. SPTN value is um, what's here? 17 okay? or 14 to stay at 17. Uh, where are you? Huh? Not this one. This one. SPTN value is 17. USCS type is okay. So again, we don't have uh, unit weight data, so we need to know the USCS type or the soil symbol. Okay. SC or, or please, please send. Uh, that is SC. And notice that this column automatically had a value. So I'm gonna, gonna, gonna repeat that SC. And you automatically get a unit weight value. Okay. All right, so uh, let's do that for the other layers. I'm just gonna copy paste this for now because I'm too lazy to put them all manually. 
and then soil and SPT data. And then, yeah, SPD as well. All right, now, um, Now, once you've entered that unit weight, okay, your next um, problem is to input the uh, magnitude of the size of your uh, fault source and the distance and the fault distance. So again, you can find out the biggest, you have to, to determine this one, you have to do a deterministic analysis first to find out which um, earth, which historical earthquake or active fault can give you the biggest um, ground shaking, okay? Or what, what is the seismic more source that give you the biggest effect? So you can either, you can do that by, You can use this one, deterministic PGA, okay, from the tools, exercise tools, deterministic PGA from historical earthquakes. So you can open the spreadsheet. All right. And then just input the site location in this spreadsheet. So again, uh, don't be so much confused here. So the first step here in this deterministic PGA calculation is you have to just input the coordinates of the project site. So So you have your coordinates here. So let's try putting that in. East is 510 0.770. 510452.770. North thing is one six one three two seven six point nine eight nine. Okay, so that so according to the historical records, the largest earthquake, the earthquake that can big, give you the biggest uh, ground shaking is the earthquake from the 1877 July 4, which is which had a magnitude of 6.6 and is located 54 kilometers away from site. You can it can give you a PG of 0.095. Now you have to verify it with other active faults. I know for a fact that the closest fault to this site is the Valley Fault System, which has a magnitude of 7.2. And I think this one is located Okay. 
speak. So um, this project is located in Pasig City. So you can actually just check Google Earth and check the FIVOX map, but you can also do the Hazard Hunter actually. Hazard. So the Castro Elementary School in Pasig. So just look for that. The Castro Elementary School over everlasting Pasig City. This one. So you have to click this one first and wait for the assessment of the hazard hunter. Okay. Nearest active fault is approximately 2.8 kilometers east of the valley fault system. So we can use that as an input. So valley fault system is the fault. Um, as for VVOX, the their best estimate is of the magnitude of the valley fault system is 7.2. Distance in kilometers is 2.8. So it's giving us a peak ground acceleration of 0 0.5567 versus the historical earthquake, which is just 0 0.0095. So what, what, are you gonna, what are we gonna choose here? Obviously you have to use the Valley Fault system, okay? Because this one is much, much bigger. So now we can put in here the Magnitude of the earthquake, 7.2. Fault distance in kilometers, 2.8. So that's just the same for all the soil layers. Oh, sorry. So you have to like, you can't just drag it. So it's, okay. All right, so we now have the fault magnitude and the distance of the fault. Other parameters here are for SPP collection. Um, you can just look at the reference charts, but you can just use these values. No? They, these are just the best defaults. So after that, the spreadsheet will automatically calculate for the stresses, total stress, effective stress. You are seeing some incomplete data here because the spreadsheet is not going to calculate, not going to proceed with the calculation if the soil is non-liquefiable or not, not potentially liquefiable. Other soil layers are potentially liquefiable, so the calculations are proceeded. And then finally, you can see here the factor safety. So if the soil here has incomplete data or is not potentially liquefiable, you will only get incomplete data. But if it's uh, potentially liquefiable and its factor of safety is less than one, in this case it's 0.35, you will get liquefiable. Okay. So basically, you can see here the soil layers one to two meters, and then six to six to twelve meters, and then thirteen to fifteen meters, and then eighteen to twenty meters are all liquefiable. Okay, so that's basically what you're gonna do in your exercise. Look for the soil layers that are liquefiable. And then for the bonus, you just look at this uh, column. Okay, there's a next, next uh, column here. This is the liquefaction settlement analysis by Zhang 2004 and I did this in Bulan J 2014. 
I'm got, not going to discuss how this is done. You can just read the paper. It will take like two hours to discuss the, this whole thing. So I just leave it to you to read it on your own. And basically this spreadsheet will just, it's just going to calculate in this column the uh, settlement per soil layer. So in here you get 0 0.03 meters. So that is approximately three millimeters. In here, 0 0.04, so four millimeters, so on and so forth. And finally, you will just hit the last column will just get a total of all the vertical settlement. So you get 0.32 meters or <clears throat> approximately 320 millimeters. Okay. Now, uh, engineers will have a criteria to, to see if this if this amount of settlement is too bigger or just or acceptable. So for the bonus ex bonus uh, points, you can research the criteria of Terzaghi 1967 for tolerable or acceptable settlement. All right, so that's how you do all the stuff that you have to do for the exercise. Okay, so if you have questions, uh, let me know. I'm going to update all the files for the exercise, so you're not going to have a hard time doing it. Okay, so that's it for now. Okay, so I'm going to upload this um, file in Blackboard and Google Drive. Real one for nine liquefaction exercise. So I'm just gonna update this one, upload the, the new set of files. And that's it. Oh. Hey, uh, be sure to understand this exercise because this is really important, especially if we're gonna work on like a geotechnical consultancy. I mean, liquefaction is, is a one really uh, nifty tool to learn. You're gonna, can really help you with your work, okay? All right, so that's just, that's the, um, can I get the link? Copy, then upload it in Blackboard. I refer to this link for the exercise. 
due date will be week nine. Week 10, week 10, Friday. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, make it 21. Okay. All right, so that concludes the, ex the session for today. I uh, hope you understood the tutorial on liquefaction analysis and assessment. Okay.